we are in the final chapter of Philippians on this journey through as we're kind of walking through the book of Philippians. And this has been my goal. Number one, as a pastor, I want, I want the people that call Hill Spring home, I want you to have a working knowledge of Scripture. That, that's my scope and sequence, if you will, that in my preaching, I, I want you to, as we tell the stories and we walk through the passages, I want you to have a working knowledge of Scripture. And I want, for the rest of your life, I want to jack you up when it comes to Philippians. Because I want, when you think Philippians, I want you to think joy. I do, I want you to think how I as a Christian can have a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered life of joy. Paul is writing this letter to Christians in the southern city, or the southern city in Greece called Philippi, that's the word Philippians. He's writing this letter and the theme of this book is how you can have joy. I don't know about you, but I, I kinda wanna have some joy in my life. I don't really wanna be Eeyore the rest of my life. And so today, we are going to unpack the secret sauce. We've been, we've been grinding through some theology. We've, we've walked through Philippians. And today, the verses we're going to look at today really are, it's a magic formula, if you will, for how you and I, as Christians, can have a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered life of joy. But before I get to those verses, I, I want to just kind of scratch the surface of what happens in the first three verses. I'm not, not going to put them on the screen. You can... Go back and read this later. But he begins this part of this letter by pleading. And I'm going to plead with you. He's pleading with two women in the church at Philippi to stop the disruption, stop the infighting, stop the division. Like your disagreement between, like the tone is you're damaging the image of the church. You're damaging the work that God is doing there. And it just, that division and fighting and I always have to be right and, and we can't get along, that takes a toll. There is always a price to being right. You can be right or you can be happy, but rarely can you be both. And Paul asked the church leaders and he asked the friends to get involved. Listen, there is a power when you and I as followers of Christ learn the, just the power and the anointing that comes when we will walk in unity. And, and unity is not, oh, well, you just always get your way. And I, no, 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 no. Unity is knowing how to agree, but how to disagree correctly. I can disagree with you, but we can still walk in unity. And, and Christians, church, today, if more than ever, we need to get that because division and disunity is celebrated and it's pushed in our world today. And the God is calling the church to be different. Amen, everybody? And so I plead with you, I beg with you, for the sake of your marriage, for the sake of raising your children, for the sake of your family, for your job, for the organizations you're involved with, even for the church, for the gospel, learn how to walk in the power of, yeah, we can disagree, that's okay, but learning how to do that in unity. And then Paul gives the secret sauce, or sauce, as my kids would say, the secret sauce, okay? And when you think Philippians, I want you to think Joy, how you can live a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered life of joy. And he really does today, he really does make it very practical in how to do that. Philippians 4, verse 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. When I was a kid, growing up in church, went to kids' church, you know, you got big church and little church, I went to little church, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, there you go, some of y'all learned that song too. Right? That's, that's this verse. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Not just joyce, but rejoice. Do it again. All right? So have joy in the Lord, not joy in stuff. Stuff breaks. Stuff wears out. Stuff loses its shiny. Stuff gets old. Stuff gets boring. Stuff becomes outdated. And Paul says, listen, find joy in the Lord, not joy in people, because people will hurt you. People will let you down. Like if I buy something thinking it's gonna make me happy, if I buy something thinking it's gonna give me joy, that puts way too much pressure on that thing, and that's where buyer's remorse comes in, right? I date a person, if I marry a person thinking, oh, once I'm married to them, then I will be happy. It puts way too much pressure on that relationship. It puts way too much pressure on that person. 
Now you feel like you're walking on eggshells all the time. Listen, and, and the people have been around me for a long time, the young people that are single or, or whatever stage of life you're in, they probably would recite this back to me, and I'm, I'm just going to give it to you real quick. All my single people, this is for you. You need someone who loves God more than they love you. You just do. Because there's going to be days that someone don't love you. They don't even like you today, all right? But if they love God, they will do the right things in those rough moments, okay? So you need someone, you're looking for someone, they need to love God more than they love you. Not just love God so they can date you, not just start going to church because that's what it's gonna take for you to like. No, 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 they need to love God more than they love you. And then secondly, you need someone who was happy long before you ever came along. Because Jerry Maguire sold us a lie. You complete me. All right? No, 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 no. No, God completes me. Miss Jerry compliments me. I mean, she makes me look good. You know what I'm saying? Right? You, you need somebody that was happy with who they were before. I, like, if I'm dependent upon you to make me happy, that puts way too much pressure on the relationship, and it becomes suffocating. The only person that can handle that type of pressure is Jesus. The only thing that can handle that type of pressure is a relationship with your creator. Amen, everybody? So Paul says rejoice in the Lord, not in stuff, not in people, but find your joy in the Lord that is found in Christ. Then Paul gets really, really practical. Like if he would have written this in 2022, he would have probably put it in outline form. Like number one, do this. Number two, do this. Number three, do that. But instead, he's writing a letter to Christians in Philippi. And I'll be honest with you, you don't need me to unpack this. Like if you read Philippians 5 and 6, these four things just, they leap off the page. But it is a formula for how you and I can have joy in Christ. All right, so Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Here's the first principle. Others first. If you want to have a life of joy, you need to be in the habit of putting other people first. The New Living translates it considerate. Little burst study on this. There's, there's, a, there's several different ways that translations translate this idea or they translate this verse. Some of the translations say, let everyone see your gentleness. Some translations say, let everyone see your service. Uh, one translation says, let, every, let everyone see your moderation. But the word they're going after, the one considerate, it actually means fair, mild, and gentle. Here's the idea that is central to Christianity. It is central if you're gonna be a follower of Christ. The idea is put others first. Put others first. Jesus told us to that. Lay down your life for a friend. Jesus said in Matthew 14, or 16, 24, he said to his disciples, whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves. Okay, put others first. First, self-denial, humility, that is a central value to what it means to look like Christ, to become a Christian. Paul is saying to have a life of joy, you gotta get past yourself and you gotta put others first. And here's the deal, that doesn't make any sense if I'm pursuing happiness. I would think if I wanna be happy, I need to be me, me, me. It's my favorite song, right? Me, me, me. If, if, I, if I'm really gonna be happy, I gotta be all about me and what I want but all that does is feed selfish ambition. It feeds a self-centered mindset. And I'm gonna tell you something. I'm about to pop your bubble right here. That ain't how the world works. The world ain't all about me, me, me. The world ain't all about you, you, you. And here's what Paul is saying, that humility will lead to a life of joy. If you come at life with a mindset of, 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 of denying my own selfishness and my own preference and, and others first, it's crazy, but how God's principles work is it will lead to a life of joy. So the joy, the journey to joy starts with others first. Then secondly, he says this in verse five, let everyone see that you're considerate, you're gentle. Remember the Lord is coming soon. So the second principle is being eternally focused. He emphasizes this by remember, keep your focus on eternity. There's a, there's a couple of, of reminders in that. 
The first reminder, the problem, the trial, the season, the difficulty that you're going through is only a season. It's only temporary. Even if I die, there is more to this story. Like this life is just preseason because the real deal is coming soon when Jesus comes back. Amen, everybody? Even if the story doesn't go the way that I hope, even if this plays out bad, remember there is more to the story. No matter what happens in this life, Jesus is coming back. God's side is already won. There is a heaven that awaits you and I. There is paradise in the presence of God. This pain won't matter. Well, death won't matter. Loss won't matter. Defeat won't matter. Fear, none of that will matter. It is a reminder. He says, remember to focus on eternity. See things from God's perspective. Because here's what happens. When I focus on today, when I focus on the here and the now, it is so easy to get caught up in the ups and downs of life. If I have a good day, then everything's good. If I have a bad day, everything's bad. But that doesn't describe a life of joy. And Paul's saying you can have more of that. Listen, when I focus on a bigger picture, it's easier to stand strong in the tough days. When I'm focused on seeing things from heaven's view, from internal view, that God's already won the war, I don't have to get caught up in the high highs and the low lows. When I'm focused on what God has for me, no matter how this plays out, heaven still wins and paradise still awaits. Amen, everybody? There is more to this story. Remember, Jesus is coming back and you're on the right side. And he says this in verse six. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Okay, here's the third principle on this joy to journey. Number one is replace worry with prayer. When you start to worry, when anxiety starts to creep up, when, when, when fear becomes strong, it, it should serve as a reminder that I need to, I need to pray. God gave us the emotion of fear when he created you. When he created you, he put fear in this buffet of emotions that he gave you. He also gave you anger. But if both of those get unchecked, if both of those get out of control, they become destructive in our life. But you have to remember, God gave us the emotion of fear. He put that in this whole buffet of emotions that we experience in our life. Many times, the fear is is a defense mechanism. If I'm afraid and fear creeps in, I wanna get the heck out of Dodge, all right? So last weekend, Pastor Matt did a great job. Amen, everybody? He wasn't wearing a Hawaiian shirt, but that's all right. And um, our son, Landon, he was, um, it was mom's day in Stillwater, so we had to go, we had a big lunch with his fraternity and stuff, and then that evening, him and his fraternity competed in what's called spring sing, where they come up with about five minutes of a musical song, and Landon was one of them, and yes, he wore makeup and had little dots on his face. It's fine. It's one of my prouder moments. Not really. No, so, so anyway, God blessed us. Landon's group performed right before intermission. And so, you know, we were there, and like any good parents, when intermission came, we decided to leave, right? You know what I'm saying? So um, part of that, I was also watching the weather. If you remember last Saturday, crazy storms all came through, and I was, I was kind of was kind of watching the weather and it was about to start raining and so intermission hits and I kind of had fun through the first half of it. It was kind of fun. It's kind of silly. Some of it was kind of funny. But my sweet little adoring beautiful wife, um, she was hungry and we had already agreed that we were leaving. So anyway, we decided that, that we would go and so we get up and we walk. It's starting to lightly rain and, and we get in the car, start the car, back out of the parking lot and, and pull out onto the street. When my phone goes off like a Tasmanian bottle rocket, like tornado warning in your current location. If that ever happens at three o'clock in the morning when you're asleep, you are all of a sudden really, really awake, all right? This wasn't no tornado watch. This meant there was rotation in my area. I'm calm, very calm. And I'm driving and it's just, by this time it's just pouring down rain and, and we're headed back to just, just trying to get out of town away from the rotation and we're, we're kind of headed to our hotel and uh, I used to work at Y105 when I was in college over there, so I tuned into Y105, and sure enough, he comes on, and he's talking about the weather and the rotation, 
And he's like, okay, well, radar's indicating there's rotation south and west of Stillwater. <laughs> I'm south and west of Stillwater. This is not good, <laughs> right? So I pull into a parking lot, and I'm telling her, like, we'll see if you can get, you know, Channel 8 or Channel 6 up on, on Facebook. And, and no, Tulsa stations didn't care about our lives. So anyway, I pull into a parking lot, and I get Oklahoma City weather on Facebook, and I'm kind of watching and, and all of this. And, and while I'm, I'm watching and trying to figure out where I'm at, where the rotation's at, Tornado sirens start going off right where I'm at. So it's in that moment that this emotion of fear that God put in the buffet of our emotions, it kicks in. And my beautiful yet hungry, now anxious bride says, get me out of here. <laughs> All right. So I jumped on the road and I went north and east. I right? just getting, getting out of there. Listen, God gave us the fear of emotion when he created you, all right? That's situational. Sometimes that's a defense mechanism to get you away from tornadoes, all right? But some of you are going, whoa, 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 whoa. The Bible says God's not giving us a spirit of fear. You're right. So the emotion of fear is situational to get me away from tornadoes and bad things, you know what I'm saying? But the spirit of fear is when that is continual and I live under constant fear fear and worry and anxiety. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God's not given us a spirit. Of, no, he gave me the emotion, but the spirit of fear is where I just live captive to anxiety, worry, and fear. I can have fear in situations. That's not always a bad thing. Might even save your life at times. But living in constant fear, that's a bad thing. That's from the enemy. That is not from God. That's what we would call a spirit of fear. Okay? Fear it also helps me appreciate peace. It does. Like when you're in a tense situation, and like I was running away from tornadoes, but finally when we got, you know, 10 miles away and it stopped raining, and I know it's in the rearview mirror, you know, fear then helped me appreciate that moment of peace. And so Paul is saying when you start to worry, when you start to have fear, you need to let that trigger something on the inside of you. Replace worry with fear. So when Landon was I, probably five, six years old and Kaylee was the baby, she was a year, maybe two years old, I just, I kept, I kept having bad dreams. And I kept wrestling with fear that something was going to happen to me and that Jerry was gonna be left with the two kids and like I just, I just kept wrestling with this fear. Dr. Bill Berman, who's a longtime Christian family counselor in Tulsa, been a friend of mine for a long time and I actually went to see him. And he explained this principle to me that God gave us fear. Not all fear is bad. And this is what he said. Listen, when you start to feel that fear, you need to let it push you to do the right thing. When that fear, that dream crops up that something's gonna happen to you, you need to change your schedule. You need to slow down. You need to be intentional with your kids. You need to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with each kid. Let that fear serve as a reminder you need to change your behavior. Now, our younger kids won't remember this, but when, when we were kids, to, to remind ourselves to do things, we'd, we'd tie a ribbon, tie a string around your finger. At least they did it on TV. I don't know that I ever did it. I used to be laying in bed at night, and uh, I would think of something I need to do tomorrow, and so I would just typically grab a book right there by my nightstand and just throw it out in the middle of the floor, and Jerry would go, what was that? Uh... <laughs> I just threw that book in the floor so that when I get up tomorrow, I'll remember that it's your birthday and I need to go get you something, right? You know what I'm saying? Like now I just send myself a text message. I'll just like just text myself until when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, a text message. Oh, it's just me, right? You know what I'm saying? It's to tri when that fear comes along, it needs to remind us to do the right things. Paul says you need to replace worry with prayer. And then he goes on to say no matter too small. You can ask God anything. So here's, here's, the, here's the practical part of this. Like scripture is full of psychology. God created us. He knows how our mind and our heart and our spirit and our soul functions. So this is actually very psychological, practical. I'm using a bunch of words that don't even go together, okay? We need to talk things out. When we're in stress or worry or, or fear or something's really heavy, you, you need to talk things out. You need to just say it out of your mouth. You need to get it out. I just tell you, there is no better person to talk about it with 
than the one person who can do something about it, and that's God, your creator? Instead of complaining and worrying to someone who has zero ability to fix your situation, let's just have a little talk with Jesus. Let's just tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our pain. You know, talk to the person who can help you. Kids, that was a hymn. Back in the day, we used to go to, never mind. So the practical, <laughs> the practical psychology is we need to talk about it, and there's no better person to talk to than God, right? You just need to get it out. But then there's a spiritual side to it, too. And the spiritual side is he is our heavenly father. And Jesus said, like, if you know how to give gifts to your kids, your heavenly father, he really knows how to have a birthday party. He really knows how to give good gifts. That's Luke eleven thirteen. 13. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. God cares what you are going through. God cares what's happening to you. So the psychological part is I need to talk to somebody about it and get it out. The spiritual part is I need to go to somebody and talk to them, the one person that can actually fix it, and that's God. Amen, everybody? All right, y'all tracking with me. That's good. This journey to joy, number one, I need to put others first. Number two, I need to be eternally focused and try to see things from God's perspective. And then number three, I need to replace worry with prayer. Then verse six, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, nothing too small. And thank him for all he's done. Sometimes you need to remind yourself in the midst of cars breaking down, in the midst of it feels like life is really heavy and walls are crumbling around, sometimes you just need to stop and remember what God did for you three years ago. You need to stop and remember how God fixed your marriage. You need to stop and remember who you were before Jesus ever came along and how he's delivered you from that. You need to just stop and remember what God has done for you. The fourth principle on this journey to joy is be thankful. And really, it's the most important step on this journey to joy. I think he saved the best for last. Like, if you want to have joy in your life, you need to learn the discipline of gratitude. You know, practice, and it is hard. It's a discipline. Because I'll be honest with you, my default is to get offended about everything. It is so automatic for me to go, <laughs> what about me? It is, it's just never good. Like that, that, that emotion comes way too easy to us. Well, there's nobody amen there. Practicing a discipline of gratitude. It's actually pretty tough, and I'm gonna tell you how to do it. Here's, here's, how, here's how you do that. It starts right there. It starts at the mouth. It starts with the flapper. James chapter three says this, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. Like he's saying, if you can change your mouth, you can change your whole life. You change what comes out of your mouth, it's going to change your heart. You might not feel grateful, but I need to speak it. In the beginning, God said, let there be, he spoke it into existence. You need to speak gratitude into existence in your life. Entitlement, a buzzword we use a lot today, usually when we're complaining about the other side. The customer is always right, is America in 2022. That's, that's a modern theme of today. Yet we are a people who are absent of joy. Depression, anxiety, through the roof. And Paul says, there's a better way. There's another way. And entitlement will lead you to always being offended. An attitude of gratitude will lead you to a life of joy. You got these four things on the journey to joy. I want, I want you to just stop and ask yourself, how am I doing? Because some of you, your life is absent of joy. And it's probably missing one or more of these components. Are you humble? Do you put other people first? Do you consider other people? 
Or is it me, me, me? Because if it's me, 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 you, you, I'm just telling you, you're not going to be happy. Because nobody else is singing, you, you, you. You seeing things from God's perspective or you eternally focused? Remember, Jesus is coming back. You're on the right side. You're on the winning team. Remember. When that worry, that fear comes up, is that a trigger for you to replace worry with prayer? Do you have an attitude of gratitude? Are you thankful? You have a grateful heart? How you doing? And then Paul says, it's like if you'll put others first, if you'll be eternally focused, if you'll replace worry with prayer, and if you'll be thankful, verse seven says, then. You do those four things, then. Like here's the byproduct, this is what happens. Then you will experience God's peace. Man, peace fixes a lot of stuff. You'll experience God's peace. And by the way, he says, go on, you won't even understand. 19 years ago when my dad died, we had peace and we just didn't understand because we, we'd lost someone we loved. Somebody. Like, it will exceed anything that you can understand. His peace will guard your heart, it'll guard your mind as you live in Christ. Peace solves a lot. I've known rich people that didn't have peace. You know what that means? You can't buy it. You can be in the right social circle and be absent of peace. You can have your dream job and be absent of peace. I also know you can be in a trial or a storm and you can have peace. You can go through tragedy, and you can't explain it, but you can know the peace of God. You can feel like the world is falling in around you, and still have God's peace. Here Paul gives the secret sauce to the journey to joy. How you doing? Others first, eternally focused. Place worry with prayer. Be thankful. Let me pray for you. God, I just... Lord, for those in the room today that, that their life may be absent of joy. Father, we need to evaluate these four things and, and are, they, are they in our life? Are they being put into practice? God, is my selfishness keeping me from joy? God, is my worry keeping me from, from joy? Lord, I pray that just these principles that Paul writes and we unpack today, Father, would just explode with faith and come alive in our hearts. God, that your peace would guard our heart and guard our mind as we live in Christ. In Jesus' name. And that last verse is so important. He says, as you live in Christ. See, that's fundamental to peace. That, you, you can't know God's peace if you don't know God. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on our Hillspring YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, take just a moment, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single thing. Secondly, if this message has impacted you and you want to help reach others, visit our website at hillspring.tv. Hit that Give Now button to help us carry the hope of Christ around the world. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.